Hi, I'm Dr. Jacobson. I will provide you with golden advice for passing the ADEX exam, restorative class two and class three. This slide provides you with my background. I'm the author of Clinical Dentistry Daily Reference Guide. This book is a one-stop resource loaded with critical information for day-to-day -day clinical decision-making. I wrote this book to help dental students and dentists better navigate the complexities of dentistry. I took the CDCA ADEX exam on the simulated patient in 2022. How did I prepare? I read the manual, watched every YouTube video I could find, I practiced every procedure six times, and attended the ADEX orientation webinar. I passed. I learned a lot along the way and I will share everything I learned with you for you to succeed, so that soon your name and the current year will be on your CDCA ADEX certificate. This exam is about following all the directions and proving your diagnostic and clinical hand skills to the examiners. Topics covered include restorative supplies, day of the exam, prep advice, procedural steps for class two and class three, and modification requests. Here are some photos of the restorative supplies. The Typodont bite limiting rod and screwdriver are for practicing. Do not bring these to the exam. Rubber dam isolation supplies. This is how I organized all of my supplies for the two-day exam. The exam is open book, so make sure you print your CDCA ADEX manual. I've also listed the items not allowed, required supplies, supplies I recommend, and miscellaneous. This is how my schedule looked for the two-day exam. You will be given seven hours to complete both restoratives. That includes time to prep, multiple modification requests, and waiting. That's a good time to take bathroom breaks and food breaks submitting your final prep, then you wait again, restoring, and the final submission. While seven hours may sound like a long time, if you divide this by two teeth, that's three and a half hours each, and then divided by time to prep and to restore, and then you subtract, let's say, 45 minutes total of waiting for your modification request or for it to be approved, that comes out to one hour to prep and one hour to restore a single tooth. So it's time to prep. First, locate the correct tooth. If you drill on the wrong tooth, that's an automatic failure. Then check occlusion with articulating paper. Memorize or draw where the dots are. Then prep to ideal. You want to know the dimensions of the burr you're using, but also measure with your perio probe. Then examine every wall and floor remaining for any possible decay. Each tooth is different as far as the extent of decay. To check for decay, check with the explorer. Decay will feel penetrable and there is tug back. If decay remains, fill out the modification request and submit. If your typodont comes back and the modification request has been approved, prep the modification. Then repeat, where you examine every wall again remaining decay. So repeat four, five, and six. At the end, make sure there is no decay remaining or else you will fail. One thing you can do is gently graze the walls with the slow speed round burr. Carries indicator dye is not allowed for this exam. Lastly, at the end, your prep may look far from ideal. On the left is what you picture as an ideal class two prep. On the right is what my prep ended up looking like. There was no axial wall because the decay was so extensive. This is critical. Do not forget that decay is penetrable and you will feel tug back, both with the explorer. It's not based on appearance, such as a dark spot on the tooth. To reiterate, it's a tactile diagnosis, not visual. Just like the DAT exam, practice first for accuracy and then speed. 
Practice placing and removing the rubber dam. Practice your preps and restorations. And make sure to self-assess your work so that you can improve each time. When preparing for this exam, read every word of the manual. Don't just look at the acceptable category and the deficient category, but know the subcategory. That's between the two. You will also not be able to talk to the examiners during the exam. You can only communicate with them via writing, so you must know the names of every wall, floor, line angle, and point which three walls intersect. Plan ahead so you have adequate time to practice for this exam. Now I'll begin discussing the class two. At the exam, the examiner will show you a radiograph. You need to determine the tooth number and diagnose the surfaces of decay. As you can see in this image, tooth number 30 has decay on the distal and the occlusal. So in this case, when I prep number 30, I need to prep the distal and extend the prep to the occlusal. Let's say your radiograph looked like this, number 30 with distal caries. You will fail if you extend the prep along the entire occlusal because then you're removing an unnecessary amount of tooth structure. Even though you're working on a simulated patient or a mannequin, you still want to use proper ergonomics. So relax your shoulders and arms. Then check if the patient's mouth is at or below your elbow. That's where you want it to be. We don't want the patient's mouth too high because then our hands are above our elbow, like in the praying mantis position. First determine what arch you're working in. For maxillary, the patient is supine with their chin up. And for mandibular, the patient is semi-supine with chin down. Disclaimer, of course this video does not guarantee a passing score. And this is how I recommend prepping and restoring on the simulated patient, not on actual live patients. Begin with proper ergonomics and then check occlusion. Have your patient tap tap with articulating paper. And then look at the size, location, and intensity of the dots along the tooth you're working on and the adjacent teeth. They should all be fairly equal. And then place the rubber dam. For rubber dam isolation, you need to ligate the clamp with floss so that it's not swallowed or aspirated. When I was practicing, I learned that the more teeth you isolate, the more working space you have in the mouth for your high speed or slow speed. Make sure your patient can breathe, so don't cover the nose, and you want to make sure there are no tears. I also included, in red, some notes that are in the ADEX manual. I recommend placing a fender wedge to protect the adjacent tooth, and then drill as close to the edge of the tooth as possible. Be conservative, but go to the limit of the acceptable range. Punch holes that are less shallow than you intend to go because when you connect the holes, you'll end up drilling a little deeper. You can always drill deeper later, but I recommend first punching one millimeter holes along the occlusal and three millimeter right next to the fender wedge. Use your perio probe to measure. As you can see here, I left a paper thin shell of enamel on the distal, and then I used a spoon excavator to break it to avoid nicking the adjacent tooth. Once you break contact, I recommend using a flame end diamond burr to refine the buccal proximal wall and lingual proximal wall. I recommend prepping to the maximum amount allowed in the range provided in the manual. This way, you remove more decay in the tooth, reducing the number of times you have to request modifications, which is very time consuming. Here I'm checking to verify that I broke the proximal wall. I can see the rubber dam showing between the two teeth. 
Now that you have prepped the ideal, check for decay. Examine every wall and floor for decay. You are checking with your explorer to see if it's penetrable and if there's tug back. Let's say you have prep to ideal and you find decay. In order to communicate with the examiner, you have to fill out the modification request form. This is where you'll explain what you'd like to do, where you would like to do it, how much, and you are allowed to provide a range, 0.5 to 1 millimeter, and the reason why you have to justify this. If you're not sure what decalcification is or decal, here's a real life tip for real teeth. Decalcification, you can think of it as chalky white porous tooth structure. We don't want the margins of our restoration to be on decalcified tooth structure as this tooth structure is compromised. We want our margins on sound, healthy tooth structure. So as you can see in this photo, that chalky white area is decalcification. Your modification request can either be approved or denied. Reasons it could be denied include improperly describing what you'd like to do, it could be unnecessary, and keep in mind there are significant penalties for requesting removal of caries or decalcification when there are no caries or decalcification. Also, if you see any stain, but it's not decay, communicate this to the examiner. Say, I see a stain, it's hard and not penetrable, and there is no tug back. So be sure to communicate that. Let's say your prep has finally been approved, and now it's time to restore. Place the matrix, wedge, ring, check if the box is sealed, and burnish. Check from all angles. Once you placed the ring, make sure the box is sealed, that there are no gaps between the cavo surface and the matrix. The cavo surface is where the prepped and the unprepped part of the tooth meet. Check the buccal proximal wall, gingival floor, and lingual proximal wall for any gaps. Here I have a red arrow pointing to a gap between the matrix and the tooth. I'll give you some advice on how to seal that gap. You can either make a cotton pellet with a cotton roll or use some Teflon tape. Here I used some Teflon tape. I made a little ball and stuffed it in with a perioprobe to seal the gap between the matrix and the tooth. It's difficult to appreciate the difference between these two photos from this angle, but the box is now sealed. When you do this, make sure you have not lost the proximal contact, so you may have to reburnish. Also, flip the tab of the matrix up and check to make sure that the matrix is contacting the middle third of the adjacent tooth. Because what can happen is the tab can block your view, so you might think you have proximal contact when you don't. Since you're working on plastic teeth, you can skip the etching step and go straight to the bonding agent. Place a thin layer of flowable composite on the gingival floor and pulpal floor. Do not light cure. Instead, fill the prep with packable composite. Go to the deepest part of the prep with the composite, and as you dispense the composite, it should push you out. I like using the ball burnisher to remove excess composite. Then I use the plastic instrument to round the marginal ridge so that it's more anatomical. Then I use the plastic instrument to remove any excess composite that is not in the prep. Light to cure the occlusal, remove the ring, and flip the matrix towards the adjacent tooth. This way you have better access to light cure the lingual and buccal surfaces. This will prevent you from removing uncured composite in the box when you go to check the contact with floss. Ideally, your floss should snap, and according to the ADEX manual, the contact must be visually closed. Beware, because the floss could still snap, but the contact be visually open. 
Look at the contact carefully from all angles. Also, dry the tooth as water or debris could make the contact appear closed. So what do you do if you have an open proximal contact? You will have to drill out the composite and redo the restoration before submitting. When you redo this, try not to repeat history. I like using the number 12 scalpel to remove any excess composite on the buckle and lingual as this scalpel is curved. Use your explorer to check the restoration you placed. Is it under contoured, over contoured? Are the margins sealed? Are there any open margins or voids? Are the margins undetectable? The composite should feel like glass. There should be no click between going from tooth to composite or composite to tooth. Check occlusion. Compare the pre-op occlusion to the occlusion of your restoration. I adjusted the occlusion with the slow speed round burr and then polished. Remove the marks with an alcohol wipe and make it look beautiful. Do not leave any rubber dam material between the teeth. Whenever you practice, assess your own work to see how you can improve. Now I will cover class three. In general, all of the previous advice I provided applies. However, I will review the critical differences. For the class three prep, you will only access the tooth from the lingual. So your prep will be a ML or DL, not a MF or DF. Also, isolate from premolar one to premolar one for more working space. It can be difficult figuring out how far apart to punch the holes in the rubber dam. A trick that helped me was placing the rubber dam over the arch, marking each tooth with a sharpie, and then punching the holes. First, place the fender wedge to protect the adjacent tooth. Then punch the hole with a 330 burr just apical to the proximal contact as we do not want to break the proximal contact for a class three prep. And then very carefully move the burr towards the incisal and towards the cervical. When I was practicing the class three prep, I left a shell of enamel to break it with a hand instrument. And as you can see in the second photo, the tooth split. This would be an automatic fail. Be very careful. I do not recommend leaving a shell of enamel and breaking it with a hand instrument. These teeth do not behave as natural teeth. So instead, use your burr, go very carefully and slowly to remove the shell of enamel. After you have prepped the tooth, your modification requests have been approved and you're ready to restore. Place a mylar strip and wooden wedge. Place flowable composite in the prep and then fold the mylar strip on the lingual surface of the tooth you're working on. This will help create the marginal ridge. Slide the curing light over and light cure. Check with the explorer to make sure your marginal ridge is rounded and check for any excess material on the lingual. When checking contact, we want to make sure that the proximal contact is visually closed. And check with floss. The floss should snap. If the floss snags or shreds, smooth the composite with a number 12 scalpel and or polishing strips. Make sure that the polishing strips are apical to the contact as we do not want to polish away the composite and tooth structure, creating an open proximal contact. That's it for the key differences with the class three. I wish you success on the exam.